Roses are some of my favorite flowers, and we've got a show full of them coming up next. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. Well, we're gonna talk about roses. They are so beautiful and so fragrant. We're gonna talk about how they often get a reputation for being difficult to grow. And certainly hybrid teas like this can be challenging. We're also gonna talk about some varieties that are very easy to grow. For instance, we'll take a trip to the Northeast, to Pennsylvania, and talk to a rose breeder about knockout roses. Plus, we'll visit the Southampton Rose Society's garden where I'll get a lesson on just how this beautiful example of a rose garden came to be. We're also going to focus in this show on problem solving. For instance, I've got a problem with mealybugs on some of my roses, and I'll show you what I do to protect my favorite blooms from these pests. And don't forget about this incredible recipe. And if you love long stem roses, I'll show you how to keep them around a little longer. And this is a show you won't want to miss, so stay tuned. I have to say, when you love roses as much as I do, and you plant as many as I do in my garden, some of them, well, most of them, really need to be maintenance free. <music> William Radler is the creator and breeder of the outstanding Knockout Rose. He tells us more about his motivation to breed roses. I uh, chaired my first uh, rose show at age 19. I learned from all these uh, other people that taught me how to do it. When they were getting in their retirement years, they were cutting back on their hobbies because it entailed too much work and decided that one of the goals in my life was going to breed the maintenance out of roses so I didn't have to cut back on my hobby. I started breeding in uh, the mid-70s and in 1989, I produced Knockout and it won All-American Award and got on the market. I took the uh, best of the uh, old or wild roses, and I cross them with modern roses, hoping to uh, get the traits of, uh, of the two combined. And after that, that seems to be relatively uh, easy to produce these uh, roses. Roses have a little fruit called a hip. These are green and immature. Uh, the seed that's produced inside here will be extremely different than the rose that you got it from. There's gonna be wide variability. If you select the best of the best, you're going to get rid of all the bad traits that make uh, roses uh, high maintenance. If you want an exact duplicate of the rose, of course you can bud graft or make cuttings. With the knockout uh, series, we call these roses self-cleaning because the old bloom usually just falls off by itself and uh, doesn't require you to go in there. And the next growth that's produced at the tips is going to produce nice strong stems to produce more flowers. This is unheard of until the advent of knockout roses. One other aspect of uh, rose maintenance is reduced. It's possible to produce uh, wonder roses by your everyday gardener because that's what I did. Knockouts are quite disease resistant to all the major diseases that are out there and there's probably a lot more than the average person wants to know about. They're winter hardy, they might die back in a severe winter to the ground level, but they come back vigorously. So you've got a, a, a disease resistant, attractive bloom that self cleans and then they also recycle quickly. Whereas a normal rose might produce three cycles of bloom during a current season, knockout roses produce four or more. The goal is to have roses that are constantly in bloom. I'm getting closer and closer to that goal. I developed uh, roses that I never thought were capable. Now I'm uh, 
setting my goals for something even higher because I, I want to do a lot better than what I've already done. After the break, I'll show you how to make a very simple preservative for your roses, and we'll visit with some of the members of the Southampton Rose Society, so stick around. If you grow roses, you know that there are lots of different kinds of roses. Um, it's a huge family, a beautiful family. Now, these are what we call florist roses. They're, they're hybrid teas. Um, and th this is what commonly is sent to someone at Valentine's Day and, or for special occasions. And, and they're, they're beautiful and you want them to last a long time. They're very different than garden roses, old fashioned roses. Uh, those are very fragrant typically, but often don't last a long time once they're cut. Either way, whether you're going with a florist rose or any of the roses you might cut out of your garden, I want to give you a tip on how you can actually make them last longer once they've been cut. Now, the, the industry has produced uh, this floral food that is actually a way to feed a cut rose, and they do need to be fed. Now, if you have this, it works very well. If you don't have any of it on hand, a way to do it is just take 50% water and add 50% um, lemon lime soda like this. See, this has sugar in it. Sugar actually feeds the rose. It's brought up into the stem of the rose. And the citric acid keeps the, the, the water, or, or the, the end of the stem from getting clogged um, by bacteria. And speaking of bacteria, what you want to do is take a teaspoon of bleach. Doesn't take much. Drop it in there like that. Now this will keep bacteria from growing in the water. Uh, you'll want to change this out every two or three days. And if you'll keep your roses away from bright direct sunlight and sources of heat, uh, they'll last much longer. Now, let me show you with one of these roses, what you'll want to do is cut the end of the stem again slightly at an angle like that. You want to make sure it's a nice clean cut. But you can see you want that really a nice clean cut on the end of it and just drop it in the water and you want no foliage in the water at all because that's going to encourage that bacteria. And then if some of the outer petals have begun to curl and fade, just pull them off like that, you see? And just carry on and you'll have a beautiful long lasting arrangement. If you're ever out on Long Island, and head to the Hamptons, I suggest you stop by Southampton and take a look at the Southampton Rose Society garden. Adeline Christie told me a little bit about the way this garden came together. It really is exquisite. The well, Southampton Rose Society was founded in 1976. It was the first New York State chapter of the American Rose Society. The size of this rose garden is really quite, quite manageable. It's, it's not that large. That's right, it's not that large, 60 feet square. It's just amazing how many gorgeous roses and places to, to sit and enjoy the roses you all have managed to, to uh, accommodate in this area. You'll see people sitting here having their lunch. They'll have a book reading or they'll have a luncheon. Weddings take place here. The Southampton Rose Society is starting to get more involved in other uh, beautification projects in the village. We really want to uh, spread the word that uh, the rose is, is a plant that's easy to grow, especially now that they're coming out with more disease-resistant varieties. And we're trying to um, educate people on how essential our national flower is to beautify our public spaces. There are so many new varieties of roses that, that have been bred specifically for their disease resistance. What do you see really as the future of, of Rose Garden? Do you see more of these disease resistant varieties being used? Well, yes, I do. Um, as you can see in this bed, uh, Starry Night, she's a self-cleaning rose and uh, she really requires very little spraying. I think that's what we're all, we're all looking for. Well, clearly you have a passion for roses. Personally, when did you get excited or turned on to roses? 
1990. <laughs> That's when I joined the Rose Society. Okay, and you caught the fever then. I caught the fever then, <laughs> and it's just been blooming ever since. After the break, we'll see what's happening in my garden, so stay tuned. Scavola, or fan flower, took the gardening world by storm back in the 1990s, and for good reason. It's a pretty bloom with a tough disposition. You see, it's a native of Australia. It's a plant that I always recommend for gardeners interested in drought tolerance and low maintenance. New Wonder produces blue-purple, fan-shaped flowers with a bright yellow eye on the trailing stems. More colorful plants can be found at plnsmith.com. You may think gardening in the winter just doesn't happen. This past winter, I did a little investigating in my garden and look what I found. I always enjoy taking walks in the garden, even in the winter, particularly on a sunny day like today. And sometimes you can detect problems in the garden better in the winter than any other season. For instance, with these beautiful old fashioned roses, this is one called Pearl Door. It has a small, gorgeous, pale salmony apricot bloom. Now, if you look closely on some of these canes, you'll see that I've discovered these insidious little mealybugs. They look like little tiny cotton balls all up and down the stems. That's actually an insect, and this time of year is a good way to deal with it. You know, what we like to do out here on the farm is keep everything organic. So I like to spray using an insecticide that won't harm anything else in the garden, pets or animals. And the way to deal with these mealy bugs is just soak them down with this rose and flower insect spray. And by doing it this time of year, that's one point on the checklist that I've taken care of and don't have to deal with once everything starts flushing with growth. Now, I just have to tell you, these roses are so gorgeous when they bloom, especially set against these purple smoke trees. The combination is really stunning. So in your garden, when you create beautiful landscapes and combinations like this, you want to keep the pests at bay. So watch out for those mealy bugs and squirt them down just like I'm doing here. Very satisfying. Okay, now it's time for me to answer some questions that you, the viewer, send in. Today, we get a letter from Rebecca in Kentucky. And she writes, Alan, can you mix other plants into your bed of roses? If so, what would you recommend? Well, Rebecca, I think that uh, the thing to keep in mind with roses is that they're heavy feeders and they need a lot of circulation around them. So you wanna be careful about what you plant directly under a rose, particularly hybrid teas and so forth. Now at the edge of the rose border, that's a different story. There are classics that go with roses, such as catnip or nepeta, which is beautiful with its lavender foliage. And then there's lavender itself, which make a great border. Some silver plants that I love to use include lamb's ear, as well as some of the low-growing artemisias. Now when it comes to plants with more flower power, try some petunias, like the Vista Bubblegum Pink. Talk about the wow factor. And last year, I planted some of that beautiful blue African basil along with my knockout roses. That and a few other perennials made an incredible show in my garden. Now, Rebecca, I hope these are helpful to you. Good luck with your roses. Once you get started with them, you'll always want to have them in your garden. Now, after the break, I want you to meet me in the summer kitchen. Do we have a treat for you with fresh tomatoes? It's such a beautiful color, I can't believe it. I'm here with Cassidy, a friend of mine who works magic in the kitchen, particularly with tomatoes. Now, Cassidy, tell me about this, this recipe. It's so simple because of the ingredients, there's so few. Yeah, when you have a, a tomatoes and when they're in season, you really just want to focus on the flavor of the mm -hmm. tomato I know. and not really mask it with anything else. That's what I love about this because you're really talking just salt and pepper, heavy cream, and then the tomato itself. Yeah, and you want to roast it, you want to put a little, can you use it for me? Can you sure. get some salt and um, You just want this drizzle. Drizzle of oil. All right. I like to roast the pepper skin side down, so it's essentially making a cup and right. it just reduces the flavor of the tomato. And you don't lose a lot of juice and you don't lose a lot of flavor. Great idea. I'm just going to put just about a fourth of a teaspoon on each one of those, or a dash, all right? Perfect. Yep. Um, you roast these for about 25 minutes at 300 and, 
75 degrees. Yeah. And I happen to have a few done already. See how they get Beautiful. all shrivelly and you can yeah. smell the concentrated tomato cool, cool. flavor? The tricky part is here, retaining the moisture and removing the skin. Okay, so you want to just peel them. Peel off the skin. Right, right. Now this is a, a aroma, it looks like, or one of the plum tomatoes. Yes. Yep. Those are very good for soups. Um, you know, this year I think we planted some 37 varieties of tomatoes and, you know, it was so much fun tasting the subtle differences in flavor. All right, there we go. And then you just kind of want to smash that up with a, with a spoon. Yep. You want to cook that for about 20 minutes. So break them down. Break them down, add some cream. Now, how much cream did you add? Because we, we just had two Roma tomatoes. Maybe like a half a cup. Half a cup, all right. And then I would let that simmer mm -hmm. for probably about another 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then what you want to do is get a hefty uh, food oh. mill. Puree it up. I've already seen the color come through. Yep, puree it up. And then just strain that through a fine mesh strainer and you have tomatoes. And you have this. It's Look at that. some serious tomato soup in <laughs> about 30 minutes. <laughs> it is, it's so beautiful. Now I have to taste this. My, that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The tomato really comes through, and that's what you want. Absolutely. I mean, otherwise, I mean, why fool with fresh ones? Damn. Yeah. Oh, I like so to serve good. it with some grilled cheese sandwiches, and I use oh. a, a goat's milk cheddar. Do you do anything for your grilled cheese sandwiches beyond a little butter on the bread? No. A wonderful meal any time of the year, but particularly in late summer, early fall when the tomatoes are abundant. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Now, look, if you want to know more about roses, more than what you saw on the show, just go to my website, pallensmith.com, and there you'll find that great tasting recipe that Cassidy came up with. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh no I can't help but smile